It's great to be with you tonight, getting ready for our Wednesday night Bible study. But of course, on Sunday, we announced that we are coming back together on May 17th, Sunday morning, May 17th at 1030 in the morning. And it's just going to be a great time. I can't wait to see you all. And uh, it's, it's going to be fun to be together. After Sunday morning's message, I got a question for this evening. And it says, in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, we are told to try the spirits, whether they are of God, by the confession of Jesus coming in the flesh. Many current heretics will confess this, yet teach other false doctrine, which new believers can fall prey to, and risk shipwrecking their faith. Does the Bible identify any other tests to try the spirits? Well, John was dealing specifically with that spirit of Antichrist that denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. But that's not the only test. Uh, Open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. So the question is, we know that there are heretics that do believe that Jesus Christ was come in the flesh who can destroy people's faith. So let's look at some passages. Um, Look at verse 1, I'm sorry, uh, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So there are people, so let's say the Catholic Church, that believes that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. But their gospel is faith plus works, faith plus works. So they do believe in salvation by grace through faith, but not through faith alone. They practice what's, in, what's called infused justification. So that term justification from your Bible is the teaching that uh, we are declared righteous by God. And we believe in what's called forensic justification. That is a legal declaration of not guilty. So I'm so glad I stand before God, not guilty, not based on my righteousness, but because I was justified, I was made righteous by Jesus Christ through his blood. That happens when you're born again. That's forensic justification. Infused justification is the teaching that you have to keep the sacraments. Now, we don't believe in sacraments. Sacraments uh, imply that you receive grace by doing them. Well, you can't do anything for grace. Grace is a gift. Grace is a gift. And that's what the word means. And you can't work for a gift. We've talked about that many times. But in the sacraments, and you know, there are seven sacraments, and so you've got to um, do penance, you have to uh, take the Eucharist, and uh, you have to be baptized as a baby or whenever uh, you convert to Catholicism, things like that. So there, there are all those sacraments, and supposedly you have to do those things to go to heaven. And man, aren't you glad you don't have to do any of those things to go to heaven? Praise God. Just believe in Jesus. Repent of your sins. And, you know, we don't ever want to forget repentance. We do talk about believing a lot, but what is repentance? It's acknowledging that you're a sinner and that you don't want to, you don't want to live that way anymore. You want to follow Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's, that's the clear teaching of Scripture. When you call on, the, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the Lord is not his nickname. You're identifying him as your Lord. That's what repentance is. It's changing your mind about your sin and the Savior. But when you do that, then you're born again. And, and the, according to Catholicism, no, no, belief is not enough. You have to do these other things. And there are many other faiths that would deny the, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But these people do believe that Jesus was come in the flesh. Look with me at, um, well, let's see, look at Romans chapter 16. And again, what we're answering, what about, how do we identify these other false teachers? Not by how they behave, although that can be part of it, but we're talking about doctrine. Look at Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them 
which cause divisions and offenses. Now, in modern Christianity, you're just going to mark them that cause divisions. And so what I just did, I, I identified a division between biblical Christianity and Roman Catholicism, and someone would say that that's being divisive. Um, but let's look at what the Bible says. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So if someone comes along and teaches doctrine other than salvation by grace through faith, believer's baptism, the deity of Christ, um, the transformed life, the fact that God has written His law on the conscience of every man, all of that's taught in the book of Romans. So if someone comes along and teaches doctrine contrary to that, what are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to get together with them and pray for their ministry and love them. and, and uh, No, no, mark them and avoid them. Mark them and avoid them. How do we mark them? We identify them. So if Justin's teaching false teaching over here, I say, watch out for Justin. He's a heretic. Stay away from his teaching. Justin's a heretic. Stay away from his teaching. Um, now, praise God, Justin's not a heretic. Uh, so you can follow his teaching. So now, this verse is so, it's just so unusual today. If, if we identify someone as a false teacher and we say stay away from them, then that causes trouble. We've had trouble in our own church, even recently, where I marked somebody for teaching something wrong. People got mad and left the church. Well, what are we supposed to do about that? If somebody's teaching false doctrine, we're going to mark them and avoid them, not be a part of that. Look at the book of Titus, chapter 1. Titus, chapter 1, and I believe it's verse 11. Uh, we, we need to back up a little bit. Um, so this is describing what a pastor ought to be, the office of a bishop. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word, look at what it says, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So gainsayers are people that are trying to bring people over to their side. They're either trying to uh, do it for money or for fame. They're trying to bring people to their side. And most of the time when there's a doctrinal problem in a local church, you see lines drawn. And you have people that they'll, they'll send letters, or they'll get on the phone, or they'll call people to try and persuade people to try and bring people over to their side. And so that's by doctrine, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, um, so let's say if Justin here doesn't care about doctrine, he just cares about people, doesn't care about doctrine. Well, if I cut somebody off for false doctrine, well, then he's going to be mad at me. But if he loves doctrine, if he loves the Lord, loves His Word, and loves doctrine, then he's going to say, go on, preacher, go ahead and do that. That's the right thing to do. That's who we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what the, it's the, in, the, it's in the, the description of the pastor. This is what we're supposed to do. Now look at verse 10. Why? For there are many unruly. Now, who are unruly? Unruly are people that can't be ruled. That's what it is. They're not interested in the authority of the pastor. They're not interested in submitting to the authority of the local church. If people in the church confront them for their false doctrine or their behavior, they're not interested in that. They're unruly. And we know about unruly children and all of those things. This is talking about unruly people attending a church. And they can be members. They could not be members. If somebody comes into Grace Baptist Church and they're expressing doctrine that's false, it's my job to stop them from teaching those things. And let's look at how the Bible phrases it. So again, look at verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. So that's talking about um, a word the Bible uses is Judaizers. So these are people that were following the Jewish law, and now they're trying to come into the church and put, the Bible says, they're, they're heaping burdens on people's backs. They're telling them they not only have to believe in Jesus and follow the doctrines of the New Testament, but they also have to keep the Old Testament law. Um, in modern times, that would be people like uh, the Seventh-day Adventists. That's, that's what they do. Um, many of the Pentecostal holiness teachers, they do believe in salvation by grace, but there's a legalism that's attached to it. So if you, don't, if you cut your hair, then you can't be saved. If you put makeup on, you can't be saved. 
Um, and so I'm glad that Justin just wears makeup and he can still be saved. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, I know that one cracked me up. Oh, um, I wish you could see him right now. He's dressed up like the Joker. He has all of that makeup on like, the, no, he doesn't. But all right. So this, this idea of adding things like things from the law to salvation you're not Jewish when you do that, but you're behaving like what it says here, they have the circumcision, when you're adding the law to the gospel. I'm so glad I'm saved, and I'm so glad I'm free. And so what are we supposed to do with these people? Again, verse 10, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Look what it says in verse 11. Does it say, you know, we need to have many voices in the church? Why do we have to be so judgmental? Who are you to say that you're the one that's right? But aren't we allowed to disagree? And these are, these are things that have actually been said to me. Those very words have been said to me when you cut off false doctrine. Look what the Bible says. Whose mouths must be stopped? How do you stop somebody's mouth? How do you do that? Do we kill them? Of course not. We don't do that. Do we harm them physically? Of course, never, ever, ever would we do that. That's not, that's not biblical Christianity. How do we stop their mouths? Well, you kick them out. You can't be here. You're not allowed to influence our church or our church people. So let's read the whole verse. Whose mouths must be stopped, who, who subvert whole houses. So here's what happened. What, here's what happens. This just happened at our church. Somebody starts listening to a false teacher or somebody lying about what happens here, and whole houses are subverted and we lose the whole family. It's, it's horrible when that happens. And one of the things that's interesting to me is when this happens, the people that leave rarely come and talk to me to find out what the truth is. Um, and that's hurtful. That's really a sad thing. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Now, in our situation, it's not been done for money. But, of course, you know, look at uh, Kenneth Copeland. Have you all seen Kenneth Copeland? You need, to you need to Google it. Kenneth Copeland has blown away the coronavirus. Just, just, just Google that. He's a heretic. He's a liar. Um, up north of us, they have had um, Jesse Duplantis. And he's just a heretic. He's a liar. Comes into church and preaches all kinds of heresy. He believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, or at least he claims to. He believes that Jesus has come in the flesh, but all this extra stuff, this name it, claim it, prosperity gospel stuff that's preached, he does it for filthy lucre's sake. Um, he was trying to raise 30 or 40 million dollars for a private plane. Kenneth Copeland had to have 30 or 40 million dollars for his private plane because he can't pray with lost people on the plane because they're devils. They're devils. He can't pray, he can't pray when they're with them. It's just ridiculous. So what's he doing? He's subverting whole houses for filthy lucre's sake. What are we supposed to do? Whose mouths must be stopped? Don't listen to Kenneth Copeland. Don't listen to Jesse Duplantis. Don't listen to Joyce Myers. Don't listen to Joel Osteen. Don't let their teaching into your house. Their mouths must be stopped. How do we stop their mouths? Mark them and avoid them. Mark them. And Are you following along how this works? It's doctrinal. It's not a personality thing. There are preachers that I enjoy their personality. There are preachers where I don't enjoy their personality. That has nothing to do with this. Our good friend Lawrence Vance is going to be here with us on Sunday, I think it's the March 31st, whatever the last Sunday in, in uh, I said March, May, the last Sunday in May, Lawrence Vance is going to be here preaching and teaching. And um, Dr. Vance has a very sober personality, a very sober personality. Dave McCracken comes in and he's all over the place. They're both men of God. They preach the Word of God. The personality is not the issue. The issue is, are they doctrinally correct? That's the issue. So you have this in, in 1 John that we looked at on Sunday. Is it important, or it's very important, for someone to believe or to profess and confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? The spirit of Antichrist rejects that. So 
we reject the spirit of Antichrist because Jesus is come in the flesh. There are others who teach that Jesus has come in the flesh, but then they add works to salvation whether that's Roman Catholicism, whether that's uh, adding the law to salvation, like the Seventh-day Adventists or maybe the Pentecostal holiness people. Um, the, those types of teachings, they're wrong. And the Bible says, and then we have the prosperity gospel people who do it for the money. And here, what it says, verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped because they subvert whole houses. Look at the, verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Now look at that. Rebuke them sharply. How do you rebuke someone sharply and be nice? When you rebuke someone sharply, you're going to stop this. We're not going to allow this in our church. You need to get right with God. This is wrong. This is false. You're a liar. You're a snake. You see what this says here? This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in the faith. Whenever I have rebuked someone sharply, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get them to repent. I want them to understand that you're, you're crossing a line. You need to get right with God. You need to get this right. You need to do right here. Rebuke them sharply. It's interesting how many Christians disagree with the Bible here. They don't think that we're supposed to rebuke people sharply for false teaching and bad behavior. Man, I don't know what to do with those people. Look at what it says in verse um, 11. I'm sorry, chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, so the grace, grace teaches us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now look at what it says. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So let, let's say that, that Justin has begun teaching something wrong in the church. Well, it's going to start with, Justin, explain what you're teaching, explain why, where you're coming from on that. Because if I hear that he has taught something wrong, but I've not heard it, I need to get to with him and find out what he's saying. Because it's possible, like, like myself, I remember one time, um, not one time, many times, I struggle with the northern kingdom and southern kingdom uh, in uh, talking about Israel. And I, I get that confused. And Dr. Ree came up to me after church one time and told me I'd gotten it backwards. So what did I say? Thank you. <laughs> Man, I, I'm, I struggle with that. Another time I um, confused an ephod and an ephah when we were going through Zechariah. One, the, the ephod is what the priest wears. It's, a, it's a, a, like a breastplate. The ephah is a measurement, and that's the uh, that's that. Remember the, the the talent of lead that the demons are in. You know these fault these angels are in in Zechariah, and uh, I think it was Andrew Amsden corrected me on that. Well, thank you. I was wrong. I, I said the wrong word. I taught the wrong thing. We have to submit to that kind of teaching. So let's say that Justin has taught something, and he he just makes a mistake. And if you if you talk long enough in front of people, you're going to make a mistake. And so I talk to him about it, and he responds just like what I'm talking about. Oh, man, I can't believe I said that. Or, you know, I, I, don't, I think I said it that way, and I, and I thought that was right, but I was wrong, and I'll correct it the next time I teach. Is there any reason for rebuke? No. No, no. Here's what happens. I confront Justin. He's teaching something wrong, and he says, I'm going to keep teaching it. Now comes the rebuke. And it might begin with, Justin, man, you can't do that. We, we just can't let you do that here. 
But then it might come into, and he's ignoring what I'm saying, then it comes into let no man despise thee. Now remember, despise in your Bible is you don't pay attention to it. You ignore it. Jesus despising the shame. He, he just ignored it. So then it's, hey, listen to me. You need to pay attention to what I'm telling you here. That's missing in Christianity. And, of course, some of that can be personality. You know, um, uh, some people have a personality that makes it very easy for them to confront and rebuke. Other people don't. But just because you don't have a personality to do that, if, if, if I'm a pastor, now, I think you all know, I do have the personality that allows me to do that. And so I've got to make sure that that's under the rule of the Holy Spirit. But let's say that a pastor is just nice. And I've got pastor friends. They're just kind. They're just nice. They're still supposed to rebuke. They're still supposed to let, let no man despise thee. They're still supposed to stop the mouths. They're still supposed to uh, rebuke them sharply. I, how can, is, is this rebuking sharply? Justin, you really shouldn't do that. Does that sound like rebuking sharply? I've watched parents try to train their children that way. Now, Lydia, don't do that. I'm just telling you. I hope Lydia's watching this right now. It didn't work with Lydia. <laughs> there had to be some stuff to follow up with that. So if you have kids like that, say amen. Um, and Jacob had his moments too. Uh, but believe it or not, Lydia was our stubborn one. And so we had to rebuke her sharply as a part of, of, of training her. Well, part of pastoring and ministering is rebuking false teachers sharply. And there's many reasons for that. They might not believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's the spirit of Antichrist. They might be doing it for filthy lucre. They might be doing it for personal gain. They're gainsayers. Uh, they, they want to have the preeminence. They, they don't want to submit. They, they subvert houses because they don't want to submit. There are many reasons. Uh, look with me. Um, let me find it first. Let's see. Yeah, it is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at what it says in verse uh, 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. So he's talking to this church at Corinth. And um, one of the things, I know that this has, uh, that, that my answer has, has included what passages of Scripture would help us to identify these false teachers and heretics that hurt people. But as your pastor, I've kind of included, I've added to my answer, why I do things the way that I do, and, and that it's not personality. Um, it's not mean, it's not anger, although I do get angry over false doctrine. Um, it's not anger. Sometimes I, I'll be preaching hard and someone will say, you were really mad. No, I'm passionate. I care a, about the truth. Um, so look at what it says here. Verse 2, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Um, that, that's me. I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. I want to present Grace Baptist Church, which is you, to Christ as a chaste virgin, pure, clean. That, that's, and, and of course, that's behavior and doctrine. It's a combination of those two things. Now, of course, spiritually, you get saved, you're clean. Praise God. That doesn't mean you're doctrinally right. There are lots of saved people that are messed up theologically. All right, for I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that's Christ, we're the bride, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, Ed Bermond was with us on the Baptist History Tour, and this mountain preacher preached this text, and he just kept saying subtility, subtility. So I know Ed, as he's watching this, is thinking about that. So, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So it's your mind that's being corrupted. How is a person's mind being corrupted? By subtlety. 
by subtlety. Man, I don't think we're going to have a problem at Grace Baptist with someone coming in and teaching the law. So if Justin started teaching that every man has to be circumcised to be a member of the church, I don't think he's going to get very far with that. If, if you know, uh, one of our, Ty Blackford, I have him fill the pulpit, and he preaches that, um, that you've got to give him money in order for God to bless you. Uh, well, you guys aren't going to fall for that because y'all are really stingy. You're not going to fall for that. And it's funny, Ty's the most stingy person there is, which is it's just funny that that's the person I used for that. It wasn't on purpose. Um, do you see what I'm talking about? Th- that's, that's not going to happen. If somebody comes in and teaches, you know, Patrick Kennedy stands up and, and preaches that, um, that you have to be baptized to be saved. Unless it's a, a very new believer or a guest, there's no one at Grace Baptist Church that will follow that. No one. I have confidence in that. None of you would follow that. But look at what he says. Hold your place here. 2 Corinthians 11. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. And look at verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. They were right on the Lord's Supper. They were right doctrinally. They were right on, the, on baptism. Now, they started uh, abusing the Lord's Supper. That's what he's teaching on here. But they knew what the right teaching was on the Lord's Supper, and they knew what the right teaching was on baptism. They kept the ordinances. Okay, back to 2 Corinthians 11. Isn't it fun? It's the exact same reference other than first and second. All right, but I fear, verse 3, Lest, any, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The overt teaching of, of giving Thai money or, or Patrick teaching that you have to be baptized to be saved, that overt teaching would be stopped. Our other men would stop the mouths of those false teachers. You, you wouldn't let it go on. You'd stop it before the sermon was over. I remember I had a missionary early on in our ministry here who started uh, in the service, started preaching out of a, a version of the Bible that has been corrupted. And so I just walked up and handed him my Bible. I said, here, use this one. <laughs> and he did. He preached out of my Bible. And uh, we're, we're just not going to allow false teaching or false uh, Bibles to be used at Grace Baptist. It's, it's just, folks, it's not going to happen unless it comes in subtly. That's the problem. And this is why you have a pastor. Um, and I'm thankful for the men that God has brought in the church. They, they, they won't like me saying this, but I will. Man, Eric Edwards knows God's Word. He, he teaches me stuff from the Bible. Um, I think he gets it from Holly, though. But uh, Patrick Kennedy, you all see me many times he, he, because he's trained doctrinally Many times, Patrick, when did this happen? Um, what is this doctrine called? What, I'm thankful that God brought Patrick here. Um, one time, uh, this is years ago, I didn't give an invitation at the end of a service. And Jeff Blackford came and said, and, and he's always, <laughs> Jeff, he just, just in, in just the absolutely right way, he said, Pastor, man, I don't like it when you don't give an invitation. It was something like that. And it really, it really, uh, stimulated my conscience, it motivated my conscience that he was absolutely right. Um, so men are going, I'm thankful for the men that God has brought us here, has brought to Grace Baptist Church, but God brought me here and, and gave me the oversight. Um, do you want to see that? Look at, uh, keep, keep your place here in, in 2 Corinthians, go to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. Now, it's fun. There are three words for the pastor. There are three words that describe what the pastor does. They are elder, pastor, and bishop. So the word bishop in the Greek is episkopos. I know that doesn't matter, but that's where the episcopal form of church government comes from. 
So whether it's an Episcopal church or um, uh, the Catholic church, they have bishops and archbishops and all of that. That's, that's Episcopal uh, leadership. Elder is the word presbyteros, and that's where Presbyterian comes from. In the Presbyterian church, they are ruled by elders. And so sometimes people try to bring elder rule into Baptist churches. Um, I had a guy ask me that. I was preaching up near Cleveland. And a man in the church, a godly man, a good, a good guy in the church, he said, uh, what do you think uh, about elder rule? I said, oh, you're Presbyterian? And he said, no, I'm Baptist. I said, well, then we don't need elder rule. And uh, so that, that word presbyteros, and then pastor, of course, you know that, that's shepherd. And so as pastor, you feed and protect the sheep. As, as elder, as elder, you know God and you have wisdom, you know God's word. And those are the descriptors. And then bishop means overseer, overseer. And I want you to notice that even though the individual word, bishop, elder, pastor, all three of those words aren't used in this passage in 1 Peter 5. All three of those particular concepts are. So notice what it says. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. So Peter wasn't a pope, he was an elder. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And of course, Peter's ministry was defined by his denial of Christ when he saw Jesus on the cross and his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw the glory. All right, the elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Look at this. Feed the flock of God. That's the pastor, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. That's the bishop. And look at what it says. Will, but He says, not by constraint, but willingly. See, here's the problem with us pastors. We love you. We want to feed you. We want to protect you. We don't want to tell you what to do. We don't. And that's why the Bible says, do it willingly. Don't make anyone t make you to be the administrator. Don't make anyone make you take charge. Uh, don't, don't make anyone make you. Do it willingly. So let me read it again. Verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. An example is someone who is uh, away, and you can look at what they've done. An end sample is someone who's right there. So as Justin and I work together, as I disciple somebody, they're seeing my life, I'm seeing their life, we're in samples to each other. This is what the pastor's supposed to be. I can't lord over anybody. I can't tell you what to do in your house but I sure can tell you what to do in this church. See the difference? That's the heartbeat of it all. And that's why it says in verse 4, And when the chief shepherd, who's that? That's Jesus. And when the chief, she chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. All right, so now go back with me to 2 I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 11. And look at what it says in verse 3 again. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from, from the simplicity that is in Christ. Again, the overt attack of um, having to give money to Ty or adding baptism to salvation from Patrick, you're not going to fall for that. But if somebody comes in and, and brings a doctrine that you're not familiar with, and it sounds good, you might be deceived. I'm afraid of that. I'm jealous over this church. I'm afraid of false doctrine. And, you know, as, as happened, this, this thing that I'm talking about a while back, most people don't have any idea what that means. I do. And I know how dangerous it is. I had a pastor here a week ago Thursday and uh, pastoring a church and the, the day before he came, I couldn't get him on the phone because he was trying to help this young lady, had an association with his church that had bought into the exact doctrine that I had just had to deal with, that are the exact same problem, the exact, and the results were the same. Most people don't even understand it. They don't even get it. That's why God gave you me. That's my job. Let me ask you this. How many of you think that I ought to know doctrine better 
than most of the people in the church. Now, of course, my prayer is that you all pass me. That's my prayer. And many of you are. And that, that's the goal. But the whole church never will because we're going to be reaching people and keep bringing them in. And so that's why God gave the church a pastor. And it's my job to know doctrine, not to be a novice, the Bible says. It doesn't say one who's mastered the Word of God. It says not a novice. I need to know this. And I also need to know doctrine. I need to know what's going on in the world, right doctrine and false doctrine. I need to know about that stuff. And so how do we, and here's the question that was asked, we know that the Christ come in the flesh, that's anti, Christ, if someone denies that Christ has come in the flesh, that's antichrist. The question was, what about all of these other things that can cause someone to make their life shipwreck? What about these other things? Well, look at what it says in verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. What is that Jesus? There are some people who don't believe that in the Godhead. They believe it's all Jesus, that there's no such thing as the Holy Spirit, there's no such thing as the Father. That's oneness Pentecostals or the Apostolic Church, like Sydney Apostolic Church, that's what they would teach. That's another Jesus. I've had people say to my face that they think that that church teaches the gospel the way that we do. How can they preach the same gospel that we do if it's another Jesus? Do you know what happened to that person? They've been deceived through subtlety. Through subtlety. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You disagree with that? You don't have the same God we do. You don't have the same Christ. Look at this. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received. Another spirit. What is another spirit? That's the specific question that was asked. How do we try those spirits? Well, if the spirit that's being described, the Holy Spirit of God, that's being described is not the Holy Spirit of the Bible. It's another spirit. So, you know, the Bible, in, in, in these name it, claim it, and charismatic movement churches, um, Pentecostal, Church of God, all of those, the Holy Spirit does stuff that the Holy Spirit doesn't do. It doesn't make you speak. It doesn't make you jabber. The Bible, the Holy Spirit doesn't make you do that. That's another spirit. That's a wrong spirit. So what's the pastor supposed to do? Stop the mouths of those people. Don't do it. What's the church member supposed to do? Stop that from being taught. It's our job. It's the whole church. It's not just me. But we're all supposed to do that. And then the other thing that you do is when the pastor stops it, you say, Amen, preacher. You did right. You did right. And when somebody outside the church talks about it, you say, man, you don't know what you're talking about. We're just a Bible-believing church. Um, so now look at what it says. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted. I love it. What's it, what you're supposed to do with the gospel? Accept it. Isn't that good? Look at it. Here's what, here's what Paul's afraid of. You might well bear with him. You might well bear with him. It's very interesting. Someone could come and bring false doctrine, and you might not even believe the false doctrine, but you want to bear with them. See, you believe that being patient and kind means allowing false doctrine. That's what you believe. Obviously, that's contrary to the Scripture. Justin, is that clear right here? It couldn't be any clearer. Now, look at what, I love it. Look at what it says. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. Paul went to and met with the apostles and he said, they added nothing to me. Awesome. He got, he'd been taught by Jesus. All right, look at what it says in verse 6. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been throughly made manifest among you in all things. It's so interesting. that Do you see the context of though I be rude in speech? And then he says, I know what I'm talking about. I'm rude in speech, but I'm not rude in knowledge. I know what I'm talking about. So, questioner, you know, the Bible, and, and we could spend, we could actually do a whole series on how to identify false teachers because they're identified all through 
Um, we're not supposed to do that. Oh, sorry, that phone ringing really distracted me. We could spend all kinds of time going through the Bible and helping you to understand how to identify false teachers. And that would probably be a productive study to do. Sounds very negative, though, doesn't it? Interesting. The Bible's a very negative book. Um, so we could spend a whole lot more time doing that. But let me just tell you, that's why God gave the pastor. That's why we do discipleship. That's why we try to help people to be able to discern things from the Scriptures for themselves. Um, it's vital for us to understand that I'm not the authority here. The Bible is. Um, but I do have authority here. And that authority is the authority that comes from the Word of God. I don't have any per I can't tell Justin what to do. I've got no authority over him, but the Bible does. And so if I communicate the Scriptures and I behave according to the Scriptures, that is authoritative. Let no man despise thee. Let no man despise thee. So um, tonight's Bible study has been answering this one question. And I just think it's a valuable for thing for us to look at and to do. Share this. Share this. And there are a lot of people, there are a lot, there are a lot of Christians. Uh, I'll give you an example. The Methodist Church here in town. Um, you know, there, there are some folks that have really struggled there. Um, not because of that particular local church's stand on homosexuality, but because of the Methodist Church in the United States, of the United Methodist Church, um, has made some decisions that are just blatantly unscriptural. It's unscriptural. And so people in a church like that, they don't know what to do because they love the Lord. They're born again. They're saved. They love God just as much as we do here at Grace Baptist. They love the Lord. They walk with the Lord. They love His Word. But they're viewing all of this false teaching that's going on around them and things that are being taught to their children at youth camps. Be careful of Methodist youth camps. They'll tell you that homosexuality is okay. Um, and they don't know what to do. Well, this will help them. Mark them and avoid them. Which probably means you're going to have to change churches. Doesn't mean you have to come to Grace Baptist. You know, if you don't believe in believer's baptism and, you know, you believe that you can lose your salvation um, and that's, that's what Methodism teaches, well, then don't, and you, you, you feel like you cannot change that, then don't come to Grace Baptist. But if you want to submit to the Scriptures, well, we're one of the churches in town that can help you. There are other churches in town that can help you. But if you're in a church and you know that there's false doctrine being taught, well, mark them and avoid them. And here's the thing. If you're in a church and the teacher, the preacher is teaching another gospel, the Bible says, remember, we looked at it in Galatians 1, let him be accursed, damned to hell. But that's not kind, is it? That's not kind. Well, rebuke them sharply. Man, you're a heretic. Look at Titus. Let's finish up with this. And a really good thing for you all to do is on the front page of our website, I think it's still there, um, we had a, a heretic a cultist come in to a Wednesday night Bible study and uh, the, our recording picked up my conversation with him and Pastor Nathan boosted the audio on uh, the questioner, on, on the cultist's uh, uh, part of it. So you can listen to the whole thing and look at the book of Titus. We used this with him. It would be really valuable for you to listen to that. Titus, now remember what we said uh, in verse 13 or verse 11, Titus chapter 1, verse 11, whose mouth must be stopped, verse 13, this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply. And remember, Titus is a pastoral epistle. It's written by Paul to Titus to teach him how to be a pastor. Okay, and uh, remember ver chapter 2 and verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Um, now, look at chapter 3 and verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So challenge them, admonish them, that's to correct them. All right? First and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. How about that? That's what the Bible says. That's what we're supposed to do. So, 
how do we help people? The question was, again, we know with the spirit of Antichrist, if somebody says Jesus doesn't come in the flesh, we got that one. That's the spirit of Antichrist. It's already in the world. But what about people who believe that Jesus has come in the flesh, but they're going to make people shipwreck with their false doctrine? Well, you mark them and you avoid them. You, you curse, they're accursed. You understand, they, not, not the teaching, they are accursed. Look it up, Galatians 1. I'm not making it up. It says it twice. Let him be accursed, the Bible says. You rebuke them sharply. Their mouths are stopped. That's what you do. Now, make sure that you're right. <laughs> I'd recommend that you come to me before you attack somebody. Um, but then God gave you me. God gave you Patrick Kennedy. God gave you Justin Yeo. God gave you Ty Blackford and Ed Bermond and Doug Schmidtmeyer. Um, God gave you these men. Did, did, did I mention Eric Edwards or, or uh, uh, Matt Holesclaw? Um, any of these. And Amanda teaches Matt, too. I think that's. God brought these men to our church. They're here. Tom May. How did I miss Tom? And, and I'm missing many. Many of you men know. The, you're here. God's brought them here. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, but, but specifically, that's why God gave you a pastor. And one of the ways that we protect those people is for me to do lessons like tonight, prompted by a question. Um, and because I want to be your pastor, I want to, I want to teach and, and answer questions that are here, uh, that, are, that are relevant for now. Um, but that's why, God gave, that's why God gave you a pastor. I mean, that's my job. He gave me the heart to do that. Um, he's given me the training to do that, and I work at it constantly, nonstop. Did it today. Um, that, that's, that's how we do it. Individually, as individual church members, corporately, as a church, this is our doctrinal statement, this is who we are. And then by the church, supporting a godly pastor, trying to communicate the truth. And if I'm not communicating the truth, then the, the, pa the same passage we're looking at tells you how to come to an elder. Come talk to me. And so that's, that's, how, that's what God does. That's, how, that's the answer to that question. And uh, I hope that's been a blessing to you. So don't forget, to, um, don't forget to give. Don't forget to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then, of course, don't forget to come to church. Now, let me, let me just make a couple of statements on that. If you feel like um, that you would be uh, at, in danger of this virus, Hurting you, you have lung issues. You know you're of a certain age, or and 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 be careful. If you don't want to come, don't come. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. Um, we're going to be doing the live stream, so if you're comfortable coming, come. If you're not, then don't. We love you. This is all going to pass, but be in prayer. Whether you're going to be here or not, be in prayer for it. And I just can't wait to see you all. It's going to be a great day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray, as I have mentioned the gospel in this lesson, Lord, I pray that if there's someone who has not trusted you as Savior, they have not repented, that today will be the day that they repent. They change their mind about Jesus and their sin, and they acknowledge that their only hope is in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they ask Jesus Christ to save them. Lord, I pray that that happens today. Lord, thank you for the men that you've brought to Grace Baptist and who stand and who know the truth and they're not shy about it and they stand. Thank you for those men. Lord, and, and there are many more than I mentioned tonight. Many of them are watching this Bible study right now. Lord, I pray that you'll help them. And then those who um, are watching this video because it's been shared and they attend a different church, Lord, I, help, I, I pray it helps them to know how to stand in their own church. Or maybe it's time for them to find another one. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in all of us in response to this. In Jesus' name, amen. Can't wait to see you on Sunday. And we're gonna, it's Mother's Day. I'm going to have a special message for you at 1030 Sunday morning. Remember, the YouTube feed looks better, a little easier to use than the Facebook feed. But either way, can't wait to see you. Thank you.